Good evening, everyone. The waiting room is now empty. I think everyone has joined us. Uh, so we will make a start. Uh, welcome to the third event in the series Towards Another Architecture. This has been organised by the Farrell Centre, which is the new public centre for architecture and cities in Newcastle in the UK. And it's in collaboration with the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University. Um, I've at the, the previous two events in this series, I've given a little bit of a preamble to explain the idea behind it. And so some of you will be familiar with this, no doubt. But for those of you who aren't, um, I will give a very, very brief overview of uh, where this series comes from. The starting point is the realisation that it is now 100 years, over 100 years, since the first essays that were later formed, Luca Bouzier's Vers in Architecture, were published in L'Esprit Nouveau. Modern life demands and is waiting for a new kind of plan, both for the house and the city, Le Corbusier wrote. And today, I think it's fair to say, we live at another pivotal moment for architecture and of course, for the wider world. And this series emerges from the contention that what we need to make sense of this moment is not a new architecture, as Le Corbusier was properly mistranslated as advocating, but another one, an architecture that is not bound to a single vision or future, but is diverse, pluralist, and is capable of sustaining multiple conversations about the active role that architects might play in the world. So the series invites a number of practitioners and thinkers working in a broad range of fields and geographies to reflect uh, on this pivotal moment and put forward their own visions for another architecture. The format uh, is a simple one. It's 30 minutes presentation followed by 30 minutes uh, Q&A. So please have your questions ready. Last week, we heard from Alice Brownfield of Peter Barber Architects in Park W. And this evening, I'm delighted to introduce Gonzalo Herrera de Lizado, who is an architect, a curator and educator based in London, whose work explores ecology and digital culture through the lens of design, architecture and art. He's currently curator for the New Museum of the Future in Dubai and is combining that with being an associate lecturer at Central St. Martins. Previously, he was curator at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, where he curated eco visionaries and invisible landscapes among many other projects, events and uh, displays. Um, he's had a number of uh, curatorial positions, too numerous uh, to mention. Uh, and he is also a writer on architecture and design, editor of two books and a frequent commentator in the architectural press and uh, beyond. Uh, and finally, as an architect, he's worked at Lacaton and Vassal, Pritzker Prize winning architects, of course. So please join me in welcoming Gonzalo. Thank you, Owen. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today and to to introduce new, new, this new lecture, um, that it's kind of a compilation of like many thoughts uh, and projects that I have been developing over uh, the last years uh, in some of the for some of the institutions that you mentioned. So I'm gonna start. I hope everyone can see my uh, wait my screen. Sorry, screen now. Yeah, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. And yeah, the title for this lecture is Curating for a Complex World, uh, Architecture in the Age of the Metaverse. And I would like to start this lecture uh, referring to Karl Marx, uh, who in 1884 um, uh, published The Strange Labor, well, one of his uh, manuscripts, where he um, examined um, the alienated labor. Um, an alienated labor that was the result of capitalist uh, society um, that he identified in four different types of alienation. Uh, the first one was an alienation from ourselves, an alienation from other people, uh, alienation from work, and alienation from nature. Four types of alienation that I consider are incredibly relevant still today. Um, Perhaps these uh, four forms of alienation were powered uh, by the first industrial revolution and, um, and later on like uh, continued uh, increasing uh, this alienation uh, in the second industrial revolution. 
Obviously, all of them like driven by the technological advancements that were related to, to these two revolutions. Technology is uh, something that uh, we, are, we often rely on uh, to drive the future. We are always relying on technological advancements to, 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 to shape uh, how the future might look and what are the next steps that we have to do. But technology itself is like moving at a pace uh, uh, today that we never seen before. Um, uh, and it's important that we question technology uh, in itself. Um, as Cedric Price said, uh, technology is the answer or might be one of the answers, but what were the questions? So it's important that we reflect on like the impact that technologies and many different technologies that I'm gonna describe uh, in this lecture are uh, having on, uh, on ourselves, on society and also on the planet. One of the first um, technology that I would like to address is social media. Uh, social media in its many different forms and platforms. Perhaps many of you, when you look at this uh, aerial view of this mansion in California, you might not know uh, whose house is this. Uh, it looks quite large um, uh, home uh, with a back garden, with a pool and a quite traditional architecture, I would say, but very typical in suburban areas of um, east, uh, the East Coast in, in the States. However, if I show you the, some pictures of uh, the interior, you might, uh, many of you might be more familiarized and recognize some of these pictures because it was uh, one of the houses that was most uh, posted and reposted uh, on Instagram uh, in the last, uh, in 2020. And, and that is the house uh, designed by Axel Berbord and Claudia Silvestrin. Sorry about that, Larry the dishwasher. Um, uh, and is the house designed for Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. This is a house that uh, it's uh, extremely designed for being promoted through social media, following like very specific, neutral um, um, and white aesthetics and minimalist aesthetics. And combined with like certain like icons of um, uh, furniture design, um, uh, what we see here is, is is the product of something that it's been purely designed for Instagram, as I said. But that barely like we can imagine how it might be like living here. It's a, it's a house that we can feel very alienated from, even if there, it had like this kind of almost sublime beauty that we can barely understand. What's the meanest thing your child has said to you? Every time I get into some kind of disagreement with my daughter, North, she thinks this is a dig to me. And she'll say, your house is so ugly. It's all white. Who lives like this? She just thinks it like gets to me. And yeah, uh, as the little work card doesn't say, like it's, it's a how that even if it works incredibly well uh, in, in social media, it's, it's a how that uh, from an architectural point of view can be like questionable in certain ways, but uh, we need to understand that architecture these days is also something that is created for, uh, for the social media and for the economy that are related to it. Uh, when we uh, search for the hashtag green home, we, we can find uh, over almost like 11 million of, of posts uh, with this hashtag uh, on Instagram. Um, another, very popular platform that uh, allows to empower people to imagine like different ways of living uh, and different ways of uh, domestic architecture is Pinterest, which is something that for many architects might consider like incredibly dangerous when the client arrives to, um, to the meeting with this Pinterest board of everything that they want in their house. And uh, most of it, it doesn't make much sense, but uh, it's uh, nevertheless is a, is, a, is a tool, is a digital tool that can empower people to, to explore alternative ways of, of living. And Pinterest itself, uh, over the lockdown, it, it was one of the platform that has a, a largest increase in terms of users, like rice, uh, adding like, over 100 million users uh, over, over that period. But social media uh, itself, uh, even if he had the power to, to connect us and to um, um, project like different ways of, of living at these two platforms that, uh, that I mentioned, 
uh, it can, and can also have like many other dark side or like black mirror sites. Um, this is a project I curated with Justin McGurk for the Design Museum in 2016 for an exhibition called Fear and Love. And it's a project uh, uh, by Andrea Hacke and the Office for Political Innovation called Intimate Strangers. And we were presented as a media installation with different screens in a room where people could like uh, delve deeper into the dating social app uh, Grinder which is targeted for the LGBT, LGBT community. And, and in this installation, um, well, you could see not only like the possibility that this platform can offer and how it has evolved and have been designed as an interface, but also uh, it was like presenting a much darker side of it, which is how this uh, app is being used in certain uh, country where, um, homosexual practices are banned and punished to, to get access and to uh, locate people that uh, are using the app. And in some cases that has uh, led into like, not only tracking, but also harassing and arresting gay men in different countries. And, and also it has, in the same way that it's uh, uh, an app that has allowed to, to create this uh, urbanism, uh, virtual urbanism, uh, where people can like interact with them, with themselves and then like meet in, in real life um, uh, and people can become whoever they want to be. It's also like a play where like many people have been harassed because they have um, uh, alter egos in, in the app uh, and then like in the case of, uh, of this user uh, it was a priest uh, and it was like uh, harassing in, in the real life on, on the, in, the physical, in the physical world. Another technology that is incredibly important for architecture, especially now that it's far more accessible than ever before, is uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And this is one of the first patents for uh, virtual reality Googles from, from 1960. Um, since then until today, now we can get uh, um, high quality um, virtual reality headset for around like 300 pounds which uh, have made um, this uh, technology far more accessible than ever before and opening the opportunity to explore um, uh, virtual architecture and, and, and in the case of augmented reality, how the virtual architecture can interact with the physical world in a more direct way. Perhaps something that, that is more interesting given the limitations that virtual reality and augmented reality have in the sense that you can only like see or listen uh, it's uh, the possibility that these um, virtual technologies can offer in the near future. This is one of the objects that will be included in the, um, in the exhibition I'm creating now for the Museum of the Future, which is a haptic suit that allows to like also enhance the rest of our body and, and bring a tactile um, uh, experience to, to, the, to the virtual world. Uh, an experience that is like through this suit and also through this glove. So you can sense the object that, for example, you are handling in the, in the virtual world. And it has like some electrical input that are going directly into your body. Um, uh, augmented reality is something that it, it's already being used uh, in, in architecture and, and in particular in the, in the building sites. This is a, a project I curated for the exhibition Invisible Landscape at the Royal Academy of Arts. It's a project titled Real Virtuality by Jill Rex in Architecture together with the Bartlett School of Architecture. And in this project, uh, what you see here is the physical manifestation of a virtual model, a virtual model that was conquering and it was, uh, it was using parameters to grow endlessly um, in, the, in the virtual space. And that here it will materialize only like a, like a capsule or like a small portion of, of, this, of this model. Um, for the assembly of the, of the structure, um, and GLs, uh, use uh, HoloLens, which is a, a device for an augmented reality uh, headset and that allow to see on real, on real life and then in the physical world, like an, a virtual reality, like adding information to it, which was particularly relevant for the assembly of the, 
of the of the sculpture. And these are also like some other fragments that were uh, uh, located in in other areas of the of the um, of the museum, like trying to show this idea that it was like part of a, a virtual model, and they were like exactly placed in in where the virtual model were like telling us that they should be located. Which in some cases it was like a very random and it like had like some impact on the flow of visitors. And here you can see a video of how it was assembled. So the, um, the structure was composed by different models. Uh, it's one of them with a specific shape that could be assembled uh, only in a specific position. And there were like someone on the floor that were like giving instructions through what well, um, Johan in this case was like seeing through through his Googles, which uh, is a, an interesting way. This is another project uh, using, uh, in this case, uh, 3D printing and 3D printing applied to, 3D printing is something that uh, at the moment, uh, most of the sample that we have seen uh, are in applied to architecture are for either like building very quick structures. Uh, we've all seen like videos of like a house that have been built in like 24 hours in somewhere in China. Um, but in, uh, in most of the cases, they like either using concrete uh, with certain resins uh, that allow for like the malleability of the, of the material and to be printed. Uh, and in some other cases, uh, where we see like a resin. In, in all of them, like what is not question uh, of this technology, the material that is being used. Um, now there, there is uh, new ways of like 3D printing and in particular the uh, 3D printing sand, which is something that allow for circular materials to be broken down and this wall in particular that we are um, building for the new exhibition at the Museum of the Future, it's, uh, which is a project by Barry Ward from the Barlett School of Architecture too, um, can be like broken down and reprinted after use, which allow also like to enable ideas um, or an ecological thinking into these advanced technologies. Uh, here you can see a video of how it is printed uh, on sand. So basically, it's uh, uh, it's uh, removing the sand from the from from a block and then like uh, like almost like carving it and then like all the sand that you see like being like uh, dusted off. Another technology that uh, virtual technology in this case that uh, allow us to to explore uh, alternative realities uh, or in this case I could say like it's a physical reality something that is important when we want to raise awareness about like certain uh, environment that perhaps uh, might be in danger due to the uh, impact of climate change. Um, this is a project by Scanlab project that was also part of Invisible Landscapes. And in this project, the scan lab, what they did, they were like traveling to Yosemite Valley in California, um, inspired by Mybridge, uh, who was a photographer, um, who had like very pioneering uh, photographic techniques for photographing landscapes. They traveled there uh, with um, um, these uh, large scale terrestrial laser scanners. And what they created was like this uh, 3D data uh, made out of like all the details that they were finding there, like natural details, and then and, and creating like the virtual landscape that we could like inhabit uh, remotely. 
Um, this is a video of like the, the kind of like uh, mesmerizing and again an almost sublime um, view of the Yosemite Valley in through through the eyes of this uh, terrestrial um, laser laser scanner. And um, one of the concepts that over the, the last months we've seen over and over again is the idea of the metaverse. The metaverse, um, it's something that is very difficult to define. It, it would be like trying to, if, as if we would be in this uh, 1970s, trying to define what the internet is. At that moment, uh, there was a technology that we, that people knew that it was gonna have a massive impact on society and allowing to, to communicate and like to share information in a way never seen before, but very, very vaguely, they could like imagine the possibility that it will have today and like how we are using it today. So the metaverse, it could be like, uh, when we are talking about the metaverse, it, uh, it will be pretty much the same. We don't really know what are the possibilities that it can bring, and in particular for architecture, like that it can bring uh, to us. And um, this is one of the description that I think is more vague and more accurate at the same time uh, of the metaverse. It's a persistent 3D virtual world, a network of interconnected experiences and devices tools and infrastructure far beyond mere virtual reality. That is something that I, I consider incredibly important because when we are talking about the um, virtual reality or virtual worlds or virtual environments, often like we detach them from the physical reality. And there is like this uh, transit of uh, information between the physical and the real world uh, and well, the physical and the virtual world, like what is real and what is not. Everything is real, everything is virtual and everything is physical. And in particular, like the, the virtual world, like have a very physical impact that I will explore a little bit later. Um, perhaps when we try to imagine the possibilities of the metaverse, uh, we come with like references from, from movies that is, and science fiction movies. That is uh, one of the most obvious and direct ways. Uh, one of the films that uh, to me has inspired me like more uh, and open more questions about like the role of technology in the last years, it was Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg with World Release in 2018. In case you haven't seen it, like uh, I, I highly recommend it to, to see it. Where you can see the already that the, the main character uh, in the film is uh, wearing the virtual reality headset, but at the same time wearing this haptic suit with, with globes that allow him to, to inhabit the oasis, which is this virtual world, like a, a, an entire world, not only a city, like, like a compilation of many scenarios. Some of them like very rooted into like the physical reality that we live in today in the city, but also but some others that are very far and very distant and that they could be only imagined in, in this virtual uh, walls. Um, when we are, uh, when referring to, to movies, uh, I think it's always good to like go back to Blade Runner, uh, which was released in 1982, but it was set in 2019. When we look at like the urban environment that for example, uh, Blade Runner presented uh, almost like, uh, well, 40 uh, years ago, uh, they are very far from the reality that we are living today. Some things uh, can be actually very accurate in terms of like the impact that climate change is having, but in terms of like the reliance on technology, it's quite far from, from the possibility that it's promising us. So this is why I say like the future isn't always what we were promised and we need to be, uh, and we cannot over rely on the, on the technology to like achieve all our expectations and addressing the challenges that we have to address today as a society. Especially when we, when we see some of these news, for example, it was uh, from uh, a month ago, um, when uh, Facebook started and um, Mark Zuckerberg started talking about the possibilities of meta and the, and the metaverse. Um, and when we uh, see that there is already like issues coming from, from that metaverse that it's promised as a place uh, or a very democratic uh, platform where uh, people will be able to interact in ways that they have never seen before. But obviously like that comes with, uh, thing, uh, with 
issue that we will need to, to address today and how those spaces are going to be regulated in the future in the same way that it happened with, uh, with physical cities. Um, and something that it's also like important to be aware of is about the uh, economical possibility that this metaverse can, can bring. Uh, obviously that is something that has been very interesting for, for, many, for many companies who are already investing in this metaverse and in the different platforms that are at the moment available. Uh, and, and you can see like when the money is there, like the, this, kind of um, technology is gonna grow exponentially over the next years. But it's, it's about like what we do again with this technology that it will, uh, it can make a, a significant change. Um, and there is a lot of like monetization of the metaverse at the moment um, and speculation around it, but there is something that is not new. We've, uh, over the last 20 years, there've been like different like game platforms uh, like Second Life or The Sims or, or Minecraft that are already offering the users the possibility to buy land, to design their own homes and to, and to take a, uh, and to get some properties uh, in, the, in, in these walls. These are the Linden homes. Uh, the Linden homes were introduced first in, in Second Life uh, in 2010, uh, with a, and the second generation of Linden Homes, uh, it, it was available in 2019. Here you can see the second gen uh, a sample of the second generation Linden Homes. Uh, as you can see, like there was in, in terms of architecture, it going through very traditional one, a uh, very traditional type of architecture, and um, uh, not opening like the kind of possibility that the virtual world can embrace. For, for architecture um, and, and, and the design and literal translation of houses that we could find in other, uh, in the physical world. So like, not like maximizing the, the potential that it could have. Um, and here in, uh, in Second Life, uh, already like prices are ranging between like, uh, these houses are only available for premium uh, players and range between like four dollars uh, to 175 per month. Um, so, what do most people think is, of when they hear Linden Homes? Yeah, this uh, is the advertisement dated, that they have for the new Linden Homes. Maybe unappealing. Well, maybe this will change their minds. This is the new Linden Homes. Customizable, high level of detail homes on individual lots in a planned community environment. Linden Homes will be in nearly 400 regions on the new Belisaria continent, with plans to expand. The first stage release of 136 regions includes two themes. Traditional, styled after mid 20th century starter homes. And houseboats, moored in slips with an area set aside for the owner's own tribal watercraft. House styles are selectable for each parcel and customizable from control menus built into the house. Navigable seas, quiet neighborhoods, bustling marinas, mountain peaks, lazy rivers, rolling hills, green forests, sandy beaches. Bellissiri is a continent with a variety of bikers and community areas for residents to explore and enjoy. It's not just a place to park yourself in a box and close off the world. It's a place to find your little corner of a vast and continuously expanding community. Are you ready? Yeah, as you can see, like the, the language that is being used here to sell the new Linden homes, uh, it's very close to like the, the one that we can find in uh, real estate agencies. Uh, even like this picture, it is showing like a, a traditional, um, a couple like acquiring like their their first home um 
uh, what are the open the question that this is raising uh, are multiple um, and this is something that we can discuss later um, in terms of like the speculation that um, the real estate the speculation that uh, the metaverse uh, uh, and the question that is opening um, something that it's important to refer to is obviously the NFT, the non-fungible tokens based on um, blockchain technology. Um, it was uh, very recently um, in 2021 when the, the first um, digital home was sold for the Metaverse platform uh, Superworld. Uh, it was a house that it was like sold for uh, five, uh, half a million, over half a million dollars. Um, and the design is now listed for over two and a half million. That same design, it was designed by Krista Kim Studio. Um, uh, it included a song produced by Jeff Shredder from the band Massing Pumpkins. Um, the whoever was the buyer of the of the of this home, the digital model. Uh, which uh, again, uh, from an architectural point of view, it's not like addressing or like or like questioning or challenging like the possibility that it can have as a spatial experience. Um, and the buyer of, of the Mars house uh, will, uh, will get it basically a, a digital model and then um, an NFT, which will be an, an authentication, authentication certificate. Uh, that is secure through blockchain. Um, that is the main difference. It, like uh, you get the the ownership of like this uh, uh, edition of of the house. Uh, the digital model itself uh, it can be uh, edited and replicated in different ways, and it will become a completely different NFT. So uh, the question of ownership and like authorship uh, are also like at the very core of the uh, application of architecture and the, uh, in the NFT world. This is a video of the, of the house which comes with this experience, like all the experience. Uh, as you can see from an architectural point of view or uh, an architectural design point of view, it's extremely extremely basic only with like uh, this canopy uh, floating canopy and like a color that are changing according to the to the music in super world the platform where this um, uh, house was sold uh, you can also like find many other architectural uh, icons uh, that can be acquired uh, through uh, at very different prices from the Eiffel Tower to the Mont Michel or the Tak Mahal. Um, uh, one of the largest platforms at the moment uh, is the Central Land, which is based on blockchain technology. Um, many, many companies are already investing in, in this platform, seeing an opportunity to attract uh, new customers. One of them is Sotheby, the, the auction house, who, which was one of the first ones to start selling NFTs. And obviously, this is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, context for, for them to expand in their, their market. Um, at the moment I'm doing the lecture, the uh, parcel in, in the central land, in one of the highest traffic in virtual districts uh, uh, is around $10,000 uh, for a parcel or a plot that is uh, around like 60 meters by 60 meters. But uh, blockchain technology uh, is something that it can be used in many different ways. Uh, and it can, even if it has like an environmental impact, that is very important to always keep in mind, given that the energy consumption that is attached to like these uh, thousands of transactions that secure the, uh, any process. Um, it, it can be used for, for many other purposes beyond yeah, like pure speculation in the, in the art and, uh, or digital art NFTs. Um, one of the uses that I find more interesting is uh, when it can like uh, uh, question or like, or like uh, open like new opportunities for ownership. Uh, and that is what uh, Dark Matter Labs are currently exploring in this project, the free house that they are developing for the ex exhibition tomorrow today at the Museum of the Future, 
where they are presenting uh, a house that can become uh, a piece of local civic infrastructure enhanced by bioeconomy and distributed digital technologies, allowing for a self-owned house. So basically what you sign as a user is a contract that you make sure that you are taking care of the house and the house owns itself. So you are only becoming a user of the, of the house through this uh, system. That is something that uh, in a few weeks I will be able to explain in more detail. Um, it will be an installation that you can like uh, explore through augmented reality through tablets or mobile devices where you could like get automatically information that is uh, always updated of, of your home. And we can put the value on the quality of the home and like the impact that that will have on our health rather than on like the speculation that might come related to the, to the land where it's built. Uh, and I, I was questioning or like uh, raising questions about the the possibility that the virtual spaces and virtual architecture can bring for a spatial experience. Um, and again, that is something that uh, it started being explored by many architects. I'm only going to feature one of the uh, projects that I found more interesting and is this project by Asymptote uh, for a virtual uh, museum for the Guggenheim, uh, where they uh, created this loop experience which at the time like the technology or like uh, to to explore to navigate this architecture it was very limited uh, probably they will be like redoing this project today it will become something totally different and and then we can see like the the possibility that that it can it can have but yeah it was uh, something that was opening many opportunities to like uh, explore like cultural institutions and their collections through um through virtual reality. And these are just some of the drafts uh, of, the, of the sketches for the, um, for the design. And this is another project that they also developed for a virtual trading floor where like people could uh, uh, look at like the stock exchange uh, in, in real life in this uh, uh, virtual space. Uh, which is something that is probably perhaps very related to the vision that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has of the of the metaverse, uh, where people could like see live data and exchange ideas uh, in real time. This is a picture that I will like have like uh, capture my attention and like uh, uh, where Mark Zuckerberg is walking into the stage in a in a conference about virtual reality in 2016 and everybody was wearing like virtual headset and no one noticed that he would walk into the stage. Um, uh, which is, it can show you like the, the also like the problem that it can, uh, virtual reality uh, and virtual technologies can have for alienating us from, from others, as uh, Marx mentioned in his strange labor uh, manuscript. These are some of the platforms in Metaverse that are currently more popular and, and currently being developed and exploring the possibility that they can have. Uh, obviously, Microsoft and Facebook are very interested on exploring the possibility that that's given like also like the speculation, uh, the, the economical speculation that can be behind them. Uh, and something that they have identified like the importance of like building uh, this uh, interaction um, with with other people, an interaction that in most of the cases is with these kind of like cartoonish versions of, of real people. And uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, since the lockdown started, we've all like attended like multiple um, events on Zoom, like this one, where the possibilities of interacting uh, between us are very limited. Um, in 2020, I was commissioned to, to uh, organize a conference uh, that, that it was like basically initially it was supposed to happen in Barcelona uh, because of the lockdown, uh, it had to be turned into a, a virtual format. And uh, looking at like what it was happening and everybody organizing like lectures on Zoom and, and after discussing with Space Popular, um, who is a um, group of architects uh, led by Lara Lesmes and Frederick Helber. Um, we were discussing like what, what, what were like the point of organizing these Zoom lectures if we cannot have like a, a special experience and where we could like contribute something from, 
from an architectural point of view to that experience. So we started discussing about like how to turn this into a virtual platform using uh, one of the many metaverse platforms that are available in, and we decided to create um, a stage, uh, a stage where like all the events uh, as part of the conference, all the lectures and the debates could be held. Um, we chose uh, Mozilla Hubs for hosting this uh, conference, which was uh, part of the Archaea Festival, uh, the Spanish Foundation for the Promotion of Architecture. Um, and we created this mini wall uh, where people could like uh, join as, a, as an avatar um, in Mozilla Hub, which is an open source platform. They could like uh, not only attend the events uh, in this uh, central stage, uh, which was inspired by the architecture of Barcelona, where originally the uh, festival was supposed to happen, but also uh, they could like discuss with each other, comment, and having like this small chat that often you have uh, in between an event or like after or before an event, uh, which is perhaps like the one of the social reasons why we. Uh, and in some case, in most of the cases, we attend to to these uh, architecture lectures. It's also like for uh, expanding the discussion later on and before the event. These are some pictures of the event, where also like there was an uh, ceremony where like uh, students were awarded uh, with a scholarship. And in addition to to the main stage where the events were held, there was a series of exhibitions. Uh, each one of them was designed in a completely different way. And um, we have to like work really carefully on not only on the lighting and the design of the spaces, but also like the way people were navigating those spaces. So we can create a curatorial uh, vision behind, behind this. Everything was linear and in every, in every gallery. Um, and you could see like different projects that have been selected for, for the festival and then expanding on, on, the, on information on them um, and the, the authors. Uh, yeah, the last room in the, uh, of the festival was this uh, screening room where we were uh, premiering a documentary about young practices in Barcelona. Um, yeah, this is something that obviously for, for us, it was like, and it, it got like lots of like media attention uh, because it was like for the first time, it was the first uh, architecture festival that was held in a, in, in a virtual reality platform that you could like navigate through your laptop or through virtual reality headsets. Uh, and it very important. It was very interesting, uh, in particular when we were uh, looking at uh, the uh, at other things that were happening in other parts of the world. For example, it was at that time when uh, South Korea uh, started like um, discussing like the possibility of creating an untaxed society. So putting regulations for avoiding uh, uh, contact uh, and for uh, like all the like regular paperwork that you might have to, to do in, in the council or in, in whatever public office that could be uh, developed uh, contactless. Uh, and that later on, uh, uh, a few months ago, was uh, Seoul also announced that they wanted to create the first metaverse to, to host all their municipal offices, which is uh, opening a lot of possibilities and architects should be aware of like the possibility that that can bring to them. So it's not like left in the hands of like video game designers or like graphic designers uh, who know how to program virtual reality. <laughs> Land having all that is appropriate. The oracle. He was no smarter child, no fear, no terror. Yes, a person is a life, but so is a cell. And this is a video that uh, uh, was also included that uh, we commissioned together with Nowness to Rick Farring called Cathedrals, um, where we were imagining like a very dystopian vision of, of cities um, and how the, they are like the, uh, Rick Farring was a student at the SciArc uh, in California. 
Um, and he was like exploring like the, the dystopian future that uh, uh, all, can only like be imagined through through um, through virtual reality and, and virtual experiences, opening the possibility of like how as architect we can like reconsider uh, the power that that we can have in in designing and creating this world and discussing wider wider concepts and, and ideas. This is also the work that Liam Jan uh, does. Um, this is, uh, these are a couple of stills from his project Planet City, which uh, will be um, in a different format in a, in a new film uh, edited to, for the exhibition tomorrow today, um, and that is opening in a few weeks, um, where he like uh, speculating about how uh, our city might look in 2015, 30 years. Uh, and how we will have to be fit at that time in, in, uh, in 30 years, uh, a 10 billion population and how like the production of food might need to be transformed and perhaps integrated within the grid of our, of our cities. It's uh, using these uh, virtual scenarios to imagine the possibilities of, the, of, of our cities and, and how they can be transformed and adapted to the needs that we will have in the future. And, and reconsidering also like the environmental impact that they might have. Uh, and it's looking at this environmental impact where uh, virtual technologies can also like be incredibly helpful. In this case, this is a project by Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg uh, that was presented at the exhibition Ecovisionary where she reproduced this uh, rhino, which is a, a virtual reproduction of the last white rhino. Uh, which unfortunately died, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, uh, becoming uh, leaving only like two females, uh, um, meaning that the, the, this species is extinct. Um, it's also like related to this is also like uh, this uh, ecological awareness is also like very important. Uh, and it's something that the RT Jacob Kutz Stenson uh, is also discussing in, in his work where, where he invites us to, for example, in, in this project, the Deep Listener, to, to uh, walk through Hyde Park, uh, um, having a wider awareness of the species that are part of, the, of this uh, ecosystem and, and speculating about like, the different reality that uh, might be created in uh, a virtual world. This is, whoops, I think that video is not working. So we move. Um, and when we talk about like the ecological impact and uh, of virtual technology, we need to look at like the physical impact that the, these technologies have and how behind the virtual world, there is a very physical reality that uh, sometimes we are not fully aware of. This is a picture of a um, data farm of a server farm, uh, which is an architecture completely designed for giving shelter to non-humans and to machines. And um, this is another picture of this mesmerizing kind of landscape that uh, are being created to, for, for machines. And this is another one that it's for, for Bitcoin farming. Uh, something that uh, all these NFTs and like virtual technologies and metaverse uh, are relying on. And uh, they have, a, as I mentioned earlier, a very uh, physical impact, not only through the construction of D, but also like through the energy that it's necessary for, um, for powering these uh, facilities, which offer unlocated in a country like Iceland, where uh, that they are very cold or, uh, or in Canada or Alaska, uh, because the way they, the, the, the need to power and to cooling down the, the facilities, it will be, uh, it will be lower. Uh, or in, in the case of Bitcoin, um, uh, in areas uh, where there is like uh, Bitcoin farmers, uh, and the labor is uh, much cheaper, like Russia, uh, remote areas of Russia or uh, China. Um, and when talking about like this ecological impact, and I'm about to finish, uh, uh, I would like to like show you this uh, video uh, when Elon Musk in 2015 introduced Tesla Energy as the kind of savior, uh, savior of all our problems and climate change.
right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to basically the announcement of Tesla Energy. All right. So uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is about a fundamental transformation of how the world works, about how energy is delivered uh, in, in the, in, across Earth. This is how it is today. It's pretty bad. So that <laughs> sucks, exactly. <laughs> And yeah, he are like uh, arriving to the stage as a, almost like a celebrity, like Elon Musk is presenting Tesla Energy, um, bringing the solution to like all the energy um, uh, issues that we might be facing in, in the future. Uh, what he didn't explain in this video is uh, the reality behind Tesla. Tesla uh, is not the solution to all our problems. It's a technology that might, uh, that is more like a sticky plaster than, than a solution. Um, uh, unknown fields uh, uh, in this project that was also presented as part of EcoVisionaries, um, uh, they uh, look at like the landscape that uh, lithium batteries, which is the, the kind of battery that Tesla Energy is relying on, has on natural landscape. Lithium is extracted from salt. And these are like some of the massive plantation. Uh, I think in this case, it was in, in Chile or Bolivia, uh, where like the larger reserves of lithium are located. Um, and they are extracting this lithium, which is a rare um, mineral from, from the earth, which is something that uh, obviously has a massive environmental impact. And uh, in the future, if we continue relying on these lithium batteries, uh, uh, it is possible that we will need to extract uh, at least three quarters uh, of the territory of Bolivia, which uh, not only have a, a massive environmental impact, but also like social impact in the people that are living out of these uh, territories. Today, and, and this is uh, the conclusion, atmospheric uh, CO2 level exceed uh, 470 parts per million, which is 50% higher than before the first industrial revolution. Uh, these CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions uh, are at the moment like 1.4% dedicated to information and communication technology and 2% to data centers. Um, just as a reference, by 2021, at least 13 years of typical household electricity consumed per mine uh, coin, per, per Bitcoin. Uh, we can tell you uh, about the massive uh, the energy demand that this uh, alternative um, currency uh, can have. Um, by 2030, only in, in eight years, uh, uh, the atmospheric levels uh, are expected to be 74 percent higher than before the first industrial revolution. And the data centers, uh, for example, are gonna raise their global greenhouse emissions eight times uh, than today, uh, reaching like 17%, something that is very drastic and something that we will be like very aware of when we are discussing about uh, whether our future is relying on virtual technologies uh, and virtual worlds. Um, we live in a rendered reality shaped by global complexity that we can barely understand, empathize with, or respond to. But it is important that architecture can support this transition from speculation to realization uh, uh, to build a more optimistic future. Uh, and ultimately, it's up to governments, corporations, and every one of us to make a change. So I hope that this lecture inspires some of you to try to make a change. Uh, in different ways. Um, now let's move into the last slide, uh, which is this very iconic picture, the Garden of Early Delight by Hieronymus Bosch, where we can like uh, look at like a future, a very dystopian view of the future that hopefully won't be like the, um, the future that, that we are facing. And I also like this uh, picture, which is when the triptych is closed, and it's like kind of like uh, encapsulated in, in this uh, sphere that many of you probably haven't seen, I and mean, because it's always presented uh, open, this, uh, this painting. Um, and I think like it, it, relied, it had like lots of metaphor with the reality that we are living today. In this case, uh, Bosch were like kind of encapsulating uh, the world uh, by, with this sphere, with what protected by God here in the corner. And now we are relying on a 
uh, future that it's uh, uh, we, we have a future that relying on virtual technology and uh, which is promising uh, what the future of architecture will be but it's important that we are uh, making sure that the those people that are protecting the the wall are not those who have like um, who are which are corporations like Facebook and Tesla uh, to try to find the solution for the challenges that we are facing today and that we might face in the future. And that is all from me. Thank you very much for that. Well, we tour far, far over the time that we were supposed to be. That's, that's OK. That's OK. No, we, 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 we will we will we will continue um, and uh, have, have time for uh, for questions, you know, extraordinary. Um, range of projects you showed and and questions you asked and a kind of sense of so many of the sort of fundamental things that we take for granted in the physical world being kind of thrown up into the air by this this sort of transition that, as you described it to uh the virtual or, or the or the metaverse um so if you have a question uh, that you'd like to ask uh, gonzalo uh, please put it in the chat and we will uh, attempt to come to you directly to ask your question um, but I will um, ask the first question if I may um, yeah. which is which is kind of in a way given the kind of the, the very big themes that you've been dealing with a kind of um, it may seem a relatively slight um, question to ask but I, I interestingly just today I was scrolling through Twitter and saw uh, an advert for the Facebook Horizon Worlds, which is is a kind of bizarre thing, because in a sense it is it's talking hugely ambitiously about technology, yet the manifestation of it seems so kind of limited. And as you pointed out, it kind of exists in this kind of cartoonish versions of real people. And I sort of I'm kind of curious about those. I mean, there's a sense that Mark Zuckerberg in real life actually looks like one of these cartoons. So I wonder how much of it's kind of personally determined by him, but I kind of more broadly, I think is the choice of that particular aesthetic on the part of Facebook or now Meta or other companies, is it, is it a deliberate thing? <laughs> and if it is, why? And um, if it's not, then, you know, what, what is, what is going on? Are they, are they bereft of, interesting uh designers who can conjure the new approaches to aesthetics that surely these as they describe these transformative technologies surely uh demand mm. no i mean like i i, I had the same thoughts uh, every single time well it was like a few weeks ago when like uh zuckerberg was like presenting the the meta and, and horizon um I, it's it's something that I think is like very strategic uh, from a communication or PR point of view, uh, just to make everything like very friendly and very accessible to everyone, uh, and also like it's showing like the uncertainty that they are facing. You know, like uh, they don't want to present something that is more complex because they don't know what it what it's gonna be in the in the near future. So this is the way of like basically like creating an app uh, uh, compared to like what it will be in a, in a few years um that it makes uh people like think that they can like navigate those worlds in a very easy way that you don't need to be like a teenager like well i say teenager because they are like the only one that know more about like the, the metaverse than any one of us uh because they've grown up in this kind of social media world um and i think it just uh, those aesthetics are very deliberate um and they they just want to present this Kind of like friendly world where uh, that everyone can navigate and it's very easy and accessible um but i what i feel like more inspired from is uh, by is the 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 kind of platform that are for gaming and uh, not the one that are like rooted in like social interaction but the one that are putting fair like the gaming experience where you can like see that for example like the avatars are like far more elaborated like and the way that you can customize them it's is far more advanced, um, and even like the the scenario where, that you are inhabiting, the, and there is like lots of possibility there for for architects. And 
uh, the very few examples that we have seen from architects, like navigating these virtual worlds, are incredibly poor. Uh, because the architects uh, still, I think, like the main problem is that they don't know how to like collaborate with coders, which are the ones that facilitate this. Like the coder is the new uh, building worker. Uh, so you need to like work with them to like see how your ideas and the way like that you are shaping spaces can be actually materializing each one of these platforms. One of the challenges that, for example, we faced when, when I was working with the State Popular on designing this festival, it was like they had like uh, amazing idea, but the moment when they were like putting them in this uh, in Mozilla Hubs in this uh, in this open source platform, uh, they have to start like reducing like the quality of the um, of the architecture, uh, not the quality. I would say like the finishings. For example, like we need to like prioritize like using like uh, certain textures uh, for the surfaces against others, or like the way you were navigating it had to be linear or like moving on. Uh, on very specific directions because it wasn't it wasn't possible to create like a full three dimensional uh, or three hundred and sixty uh, experience. Um, and the moment that they realized of that, it was the moment when they were like working with a VR coder uh, because before it was all like very beautiful drawings and very beautiful ideas. But it's the moment when you start materializing them when you see like the reality of that. In the same way that the, as I mentioned at the beginning, like a client arrived with like wonderful idea that they have found on Instagram or in Pinterest. And when they face the reality and they go to the architect and to the building worker uh, or the contractor, they realize that it's completely out of budget or it's something that they cannot materialize. So it went like expectation meet reality, I guess. So there's a kind of value engineering. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Like the only thing is like we need to like architect need to like learn how to uh, operate with the new uh, engineers. Um, okay, so um, I so I've gone from I guess what I kind of teed up as being a kind of relatively trivial question, although maybe the, you know the answer perhaps proved that it wasn't. To you know, very grand. <laughs> big question which kind of touches on something you mentioned uh, at the end of your talk but that idea of the role of architecture and the role of architects you said that architects can't just leave this to game designers to graphic designers which I guess is partly about self-interest architects won't exist in the same way or have the same importance even if it is you know a, a pale reflection of what it used to be um, if they don't get involved in these technologies but i think there was also a kind of more positive generative uh possibility that you suggested of 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 architects actually kind of navigating <laughs> this mm -hmm. helping to navigate this transition for us and ensuring that you know we don't end up in that the, we don't the, veer too much towards the 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 the, the, the darker side of that Hieronymus Bosch vision, but maybe at least stay in the middle or, or you know, mm. who knows, veered more towards the um, uh, a slightly more utopian path. I mean, the question is, how, how, does, that, how does that happen? How can architects um, begin to grapple with these questions if, as you say, you know, that thing about working with a coder is still, um, you know, alien to, I would imagine, 99.9% .9 of architects working today. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. The thing is that if we look at the city that we are like uh, walking through on a daily basis, like uh, many of the spaces that we are inhabiting are not designed by architects. Uh, if we go to a shopping center, uh, often like there is no or minimum intervention of architect there, or you go to a tube station and there are like many buildings that they uh, are like the design, they're designed led by engineers and by uh, other professionals. So in the same way, I think it will happen in the in the virtual world. We will find like a very good archi architectural example that perhaps are led by by architects. In some other cases, there will be um, uh, other uh, that will be like led by video game designers or other type of uh, designer that know how to design in this in this world. Um, and I think like, uh, uh, that, you know, like when, when I'm teaching uh, at Central St. Martins and when I see uh, like the results of like the students in many cases, like the proposal that they have uh, very, uh, in, in many cases, they cannot be built in the, uh, they won't be built in the physical world, but the ideas are still there. So I think like there is a lot of possibility and like there is certain training that is like very, 
valid for for architects to like extrapolate and, and, and move into the the virtual world and it's like how uh, like teaching and, and education architectural education is adapting also like and opening the doors for like this uh, for architects to to work in these virtual worlds, which is something that is not happening yet, and it, it's yet to happen. There is only like very few um, schools in the world that are already offering a program that is purely dedicated to, to it. For example, Faith Popular are now uh, teaching in, in LA uh, in one of these courses, or at the SciArc, they are like teaching um, this. But there are very few schools, in particular in the UK, I would say like there is none that is teaching people how to like collaborate, for example, with a coder. Uh, which is something that is going to be incredibly important in the future for their professional practice. I think there is a question from Marin. There is. Marin, uh, wherever you are, um, we should be able to unmute you and you'd be able to ask the question yourself. Yeah, Marin, do you want to make the question yourself? Hi, guys. Hi, Marin. Nice Hi, very to good see, see you there. <laughs> and you. yeah, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, especially because it touches upon this, you know, the discourse of, you know, the interface between the virtual and the actual. And of course, you know, uh, the virtual ecology where, you know, desires manifest and is it as actual as the physical world. And it seemed to me that the metaverse that you, you know, described could render the virtual more real than the actual to the user and the community. So, uh, you know, obviously as, you know, a maker of the physical world, we architects and designers, we wonder, are there any challenges in curating this kind of sensitive relationship? Because you could turn, flip it in a way that actually the virtual is more real than the actual. You know, um, well, it is more real and it's more unreal. I mean, like it depends <laughs> on how we define the real. No, I mean, like the what, the reality, like at the moment, to navigate the metaverse, uh, we have like very limited tools. Mm -hmm. it, it can be either through your laptop, which is uh, on a screen, in which case you only have like a, a visual and an audio input. Uh, or it can be, uh, if, if you put like VR headset, it can become more spatial. And mm -hmm. then it, like, even with like this haptic suit, you can like translate that, that uh, experience into like a tactile one that you, you feel in your body. So the technology is not there to make it like a, a full experience in the same way that we can like feel a full experience in the physical mm -hmm. world. Uh, and we are still like building the path towards that. And it's until the technology is not there, and most importantly, perhaps that is accessible to everyone, that it can have a, a real impact uh, on defining like experiences that can be like uh, equivalent in the mm -hmm. in the sense in the way that they are enhancing more senses. Um, that uh, that the metaverse will become uh, an equivalent reality to to the physical reality, I would say. But there is something that many people might question, might argue, uh, and saying that they will be like two parallel realities, and uh, we yeah. cannot just take the same of the physical world into mm -hmm. in the virtual world. Uh, but I would say like the uh, even like the interaction with people is, is totally different. It allows yes. to like be whoever you want and to create your avatar and to present yourself in the way you want, which is which we are already doing in social media. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, on the other hand, it can come with like many other constraints that mm -hmm. uh, technology will need to catch up in order to all these ambitions that are put into the metaverse can be achieved. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you. No worry. <laughs> yeah, there is another question, Owen, uh, about like whether it's necessary to learn coding in order to create an architectural things in the metaverse. Absolutely not. Uh, there are like many, many platforms. I mentioned just a few of them in the in the presentation that are very accessible to everyone and they can like you can design things there that are uh, in in a very easy way uh, mozilla hubs is one of them but obviously they have their limitation the moment you want to create like more complex architectures in the virtual world is when when you start like uh, needing like a, a more like server capacity and like more uh, skills to to operate and it like 
it's not about like learning coding. I think like the future is about collaboration. We always, I think like architects always say that, but no always do that. Um, and it's uh, about learning how to collaborate with them, which is a skill that needs to be learned and uh, it should be uh, something that we let uh, independently or like through this and the program in the schools, I guess. Do we have any further? I don't see any more questions, um, but I don't know if like anyone, people are very shy or yeah. Last call for some more questions from the chat. Um, I have a few. <laughs> I, I mean, you start. You started um, talking about um, alienation, which I think is a really interesting way of thinking about this because I think one of the effects of social media has been to kind of exacerbate alienation, and mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the uh, questions over it is the extent to which the technology itself is neutral or not. Um, is it merely reflecting <laughs> society to itself or mm. is it the, the, the structures of those technologies? Is that exacerbating, um, you know, e existing divisions? And I think perhaps the answer is 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 increasingly looking like it's towards the latter. There is some, you know, is some something kind of inherent about how social media functions, which is to do with the anonymity, it's to do with the um, the kind of limited forms of expression, all those kinds of things, that mm. it ensures that arguments very quickly develop. Um, I and I and I, and that makes me kind of think. Well, what? How's that going to um, manifest in? The metaverse or the group of technologies that constitute the metaverse is is it is anything in them different <laughs> to uh where we are with social media or is it or we, is it just going to get even worse and i can kind of i can see it from both sides in a way but i was really interested in in if you kind of go along with my kind of characterization how how do you see these these kind of two two directions or is it two directions yeah, I mean, like uh, what I really mentioned in the in the lecture, like there is a technology never neutral. It's about how you use it, uh, and and in particular when you are creating, when people are creating these walls, it's uh, there is um, a regulation that needs to be put in place. We've seen like the first cases, uh, the first case of harassment um, in in the metaverse. And there are like many other questions that are perhaps more related to the speculation of, of this world um, that need to be, uh, they, they need regulation and they, they need to like um, be taken care of. Um, and that is something that at the moment is not happening. I mean, like we've seen that uh, obviously like Facebook, for example, are targeting toward like creating this platform that is a social platform where it's not alienating, but it's uh, and it, uh, it's a, a way where you can like interact with other and socialize and like meet other people. But, but there will be a moment that uh, if more users uh, start making use of it and like we know like how many trolls can jump into a Zoom call and, and change your uh, screen into like a porn site or whatever. Um, uh, that can happen uh, obviously in, uh, in the metaverse. Um, and we saw on the power that Facebook and bots can have even in like political elections. And, and there is something uh, through Cambridge Analytics and, and all these uh, issues that have arisen over the last years. And the metaverse is only gonna be another platform for uh, people to, to, to alter and to play with and like to, uh, potentially very uh, very damaging uh, in certain ways but it's it's about how, how we use them and how it regulated and how it is protected to to create like the democratic space that uh, the virtual has always promised us i would say i think 
we we've run over so we'll, we will draw things uh to a close there but this this is a conversation that you know <laughs> i can is it at the beginning of many conversations it, i mean like uh, it was an introduction to the metaverse <laughs> absolutely so um it, you know very much the, the start of something and thank you um gonzalo for um uh, i think ensuring that conversation starts from a kind of very informed um uh, position and and bringing to the fore the, the, sort of the really fundamental questions that, that these, these technologies pose to, to us and to architecture in particular. So thank you very much. Uh, we pick up the series again next Wednesday with our very own Ruth Morrow, who is Professor of Biological Architecture at Newcastle University, where she is also head of School X, which is a new interdisciplinary school. Ruth will be talking on designing the material so please do join us then, same time, same place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Owen, for your invitation. And I hope like the rest of the series goes really well. And congratulations on curating it. Thank you, you're, you're very kind. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending.